This is part one of a three-part teaching on the Lord's Prayer. This is a presentation that was given at Faith Community Church in Ocean Shores, Washington. Good evening, church. Over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be taking a deep look at Jesus' teaching on how to pray from Matthew 6, 9 through 13. This, of course, is the Lord's Prayer. Now, I'm not going to ask you to recite it, because in a group setting, there's always that awkward part where half of you say debtors and the other half say trespassers. Then there's that ending where you're not sure if you're supposed to add, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And you have to look up the pastor to see if he's saying it before you know whether to go on or not. So rather than subject you to potential embarrassment, I'll just read it as written in Matthew 6. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. May God bless the reading of his word. Just prior to this section of scripture, Jesus had been teaching on the Mount of Olives, the Beatitudes, throughout which he compared the way the world views things as opposed to the way God sees things. So when he began to teach his disciples, he again made this worldly contrast. Matthew 6, 7 and 8. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Take notice of the end of that verse. Your father knows what you need before you ask him. So you could legitimately ask the question, if God already knows our needs, why pray at all? Philippians 4, verses 5 and 6. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And Hebrews 4, 16. Let us then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The simple fact is that as Christians, we are told to pray, and I would venture a guess that we all do. For our meals, we ask for a blessing. We ask for the needs of others when they are brought to our attention. We pray for a good visit to the doctor's office. In fact, I feel safe in saying that if you are a Christian and you're truly concerned about living your life following Jesus, you toss up prayers on a pretty constant basis. I spent my days working as a software developer, and I can tell you that more than one prayer was said over lines of code. Dear Lord, please make this program work this time. I don't want to denigrate or discourage those prayers. We should keep right on praying for the washer to hold out for another six months or for that raise, and for the kids, and keep praying for that bump on your back that just won't seem to go away. It's said that prayer is our conversation with God, and it's often compared to the closeness that we might have with our spouse. And that's a good example. You wouldn't have much of a relationship with your wife or your family if you never spoke with them. That's true. And I often speak of very important and very trivial things to my wife in our conversations. I wouldn't expect any less of my relationship with Jesus. But when the disciples asked Jesus to teach them to pray, he didn't say to them, just talk to God like you're talking to me right now. That'll be fine. It's all good. No, he laid out pretty specific ways to pray. Today, we read the Lord's Prayer, and we think of it as just that, a prayer. We recite it just as written. We teach it in Sunday school class to our kids just as written. But what is it that Jesus was actually saying to his followers? Whenever you pray, just recite these five lines. No, Jesus gave them an outline for how to pray. You all know what an outline is. We think of them today as bullet points on a presentation, because that's where we most frequently see them. But outlines are a great teaching tool. They're a good way to capture in memory the most important points of a matter. They've long been employed as an effective way to teach. And that's what Jesus was doing. The Lord's Prayer is Jesus' PowerPoint presentation to his disciples. 
When you pray, pray in this order of importance. What we're going to do over the next couple of Thursdays is walk through Jesus' outline and dissect what it was that he was teaching. In the end, I pray that you see prayer in a new light and maybe your prayer life will be a bit deeper. Let's start with the outline as Jesus gave it. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That's the way Jesus laid it out for them. And we're going to break it down even to smaller chunks like this. You should approach with the right perspective. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. You should ask the right questions. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts. You should anticipate the right response. As we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Tonight, we're going to begin by looking at how we approach God. There are four aspects of God and our relationship to Him that should create the proper attitude in us, in us when we approach God through prayer. Understanding these help us to put God in the right perspective. The first thing we should understand is God has chosen to be our Father. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It is the scripture declaration of Jesus Christ, plainly saying that he is the very word of God and is indeed God himself. The next ten verses explain that he was manifest in the flesh, and why? To illuminate the sins of man so that we might realize our need for a Savior. Verse 11 then says that most of the world rejected him. But verse 12 says, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. Consider adoption for a moment. When a parent adopts a child, what changes? For the child, not much. Where they live and who they live with changes, but realistically, nothing fundamentally changes in them. They are still the same person, with the same personality, faults, strengths, and attitude. However, a lot changes for the parent. They've agreed to assume an entirely new role. They pledge to care for and provide for this person. They pledge their future and their past to them. They have said to the child, What I have, I hold in trust for you. You have become my heir, the future possessor of what I have, what I have had, and all that I will have. When verse 12 says that because of our belief in Jesus Christ, the Word of God, God gave us the right to become children of God. In doing so, God has become our Father, and He alone is responsible for our well-being. Romans 8:15 through 17 says this, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. So my question is this, how do you approach your father? My guess is that your approach has changed over years. When my kids were small, their approach was bold. They demanded attention, they interrupted, and they were unapologetic about it. It didn't matter what I was doing, they would toddle in, arms stretched out, demanding my attention. So I've always found this picture a great illustration of prayer. I'm sure you recognize President Kennedy, and you might notice Robert McNamara to the left. And I'm pretty certain the guy with his back to the camera, the one with the big ears, is Lyndon Johnson. Given that group, I bet they were discussing something really important. When it comes to prayer, I've always imagined that that's me, right there under the desk. There's God, busy holding the universe together conversing with Jesus and the Holy Spirit. But I'm right there, hanging around his feet. As my kids grew, they showed some restraint. They waited for the proper moment, often a moment when they thought most benefited them. 
but they still had no hesitancy when the moment was right. When they grew into adulthood, the approach became more like a treasured friend. The relationship has an ease about it, but always with respect to my position in the family. Jesus began his teaching on prayer by describing the proper attitude we should have when we approach God in prayer, and the first instruction was to adjust our attitude by considering our relationship to God as a loving Father. There will be times when we need to just barge in, hands held high, seeking His loving attention. There might be other times when we're tempted to hold back, knowing that what we need only He can really provide, fooling ourselves sometimes into thinking that we need to approach it just the right time because it's so important and we have to get it right. Then there'll be those times when we just want his company. We have a desire to be near him, to hear his voice, to share a moment, to rest in his company. Regardless of how or why we approach God in prayer, our attitude should be in recognizing the position he holds as father. By adopting us, he purposed to assume the role of provider and protector, to be our father. So Jesus taught us that we can enter boldly knowing that we are loved and treasured, but enter respectfully and gratefully, knowing that God didn't need this job, but desired it out of his love for us. Next, Jesus taught us where our Father is. He's in heaven. Throughout human history, man has tried to do the impossible. In literature, in poetry, in music, in film, and in art, man has tried to describe or show what heaven is like. But how do you describe something so outside of our experience when all you have to work with is the human experience? We ponder, amazed, and often confused by John's description of what he saw in Revelation. But all he had were human words to describe the indescribable. Take, for instance, John's first description of what he saw. Revelations 1, 12-17 then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands one like the Son of Man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. God, who is our Father, is in heaven. He is in that place that is beyond description, a place that defies our ability to describe it, let alone comprehend it. But wait, there's more. Not only is he in it, he is the power that holds it all together. First Chronicles 29.11 says, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heaven and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Our Father is the one that holds the galaxies in his hand. He set the boundaries of the universe, while, at the same time, put the color into the petals of a flower. There is no task too extreme for his might, nor is one too small for his attention. And he's my dad. If that doesn't excite you when you pray, then you haven't yet come to grips with who you're praying to. My favorite chapter in the Bible is Job 38. We all know the story. All manner of tribulation befell Job, but not a single one that did not first pass through the hand of God. His friends and his wife all accused him of having offended God. His wife told him just to curse God and die. Before we get it to chapter 38, Job is questioning where God is and how could God's hand be in his situation. Then chapter 28 comes, and it begins like this. Then the Lord answered Job out of a whirlwind and said, who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man, I will question you, and you make it known to me. 
All of chapter 38 and 39 are a laundry list of the things that God can do that man cannot do. Seventy verses of God laying out questions for Job, many of them beginning like this. Where were you, Job? See, God was in heaven when the foundations of the universe were being laid, and when the oceans were put in their place and the stars hung in the sky. God was the one that turned the lights on. On and on the chapters go, reminding Job of the awesome power of God that he wields from heaven, and reminding Job he still sits in heaven, and all creation is still at his command. Then in chapter 40, God concludes, And the Lord said to Job, Shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? He who argues with God, let him answer it. Our Father is in heaven, and we don't approach prayer so that we can wrestle or contend with God. God has his determinate will. Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. We may have contention in prayer. But our contention is not with God, but with ourselves. When we approach prayer as if we're entering a boxing ring ready to wear God down with body blows, or like we're buying a new car, haggling and putting our best deal on the table, take it or leave it, God, we miss what Jesus said to his disciples just before he began his PowerPoint outline. Your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Your contention Trying to convince God to change his mind is nothing short of you not taking yes for an answer. But when you place God where he belongs, truly understanding what God says in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Then you realize, as Job did, God is still in heaven. Heaven and earth, and all contained within, are still under his control. Your perceptions of what you want, or what you think you need, are to presume that your thoughts are greater than God's thoughts. They're not. But there is still good news. He's your dad. It's a good thing that as Christians we've been given the Holy Spirit so that we might have some understanding of the things of God, because again, our language simply fails us. 1 Peter 1, 14-16 says this, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. We think of holy in such small terms. We see ourselves and our Christian friends. We listen to sermons and we're told to be holy people. But we know we aren't. Then when we look at those Christians that we admire and the great work that they do, and we think, man, I'd like to be holy like them. I'd like to be holy like Martin Luther. I'd like to be holy like Charles Spurgeon. I'd like to be holy like Billy Graham. I'd like to be holy, like Michael Duncan. We do this, and our understanding of holiness becomes very diluted. We start to think of holiness as the things we do as we try to follow Jesus' example. But that's a misunderstanding of holy. We think it's a behavior, the things that we do. But holy is a state of being. The word means to be ceremonially consecrated. Ceremonial means a formal act performed with a set ritual. Consecrated means to be set apart, separate from other things. As Christians, we are ceremonially set apart because we've been saved through a prescribed order. Now, the military is big on ceremony. They have one for every occasion. Promotions, change of command, raising or retiring of the colors, How to accomplish these ceremonies is written out and expected to be followed each and every time. I remember when I graduated boot camp in the Marine Corps, 13 weeks into my enlistment, but up to that point, I hadn't been a Marine. I was a boot. I had not yet earned the right to be called a Marine. But at a certain time in the graduation ceremony, our company commander said, Congratulations, Marines. It was at that point 
I became unique. I could call myself something that only others who had gone through the same ceremony could be called, a Marine. Now, for those of you that served in other branches, I'm not saying better, just unique. The better part, I'll leave as implied. God, our Father in Heaven, has written out the rules of order for the ceremony by which Christians are consecrated. Ephesians 2.8 For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of your own doing, it is a gift of God. There it is. There's the ceremonial ritual. It is always done this way. No variations. Every Christian is saved in exactly the same way. Grace is granted by God so that you are able to accept the faith also granted by God, the very faith that is needed to accept Christ as the only means of salvation, so that by obedience to the Word of God, you can live to the glory of God and not to self. You have been consecrated by God. You have been cleaned and set apart to be used by a God that is pure and righteous and holy in every way. You have been given the right to call yourself by a name that only those who have been consecrated can be called a child of God. You are no longer like the world. You are a new creation. But in what way are you new? What makes you separate and unique? 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. We are unique because we are the dwelling place of God, the Holy Spirit. You are unlike anything else in the universe except for other Christians. God doesn't dwell in rocks or trees. God doesn't dwell in crystals, pyramids, or mystic tokens. He doesn't dwell in puppies or even fluffy kittens. He doesn't dwell in the stars or in a galaxy far, far away. And God doesn't dwell in unbelievers. 2 Timothy 1.14 says, By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Our Father, God has adopted me to be his child. He's in heaven. I am a child of the one that created the entire universe and all that is in it. My Father holds every atom of existence in place simply by the power of his word. Hallowed be thy name. The righteous and holy God has chosen me to be his dwelling place, and by faith in Christ, I can stand before him holy because he is holy. See, when we approach praying with the right perspective on who God is, it cannot help but set our minds on the enormity of God and yet how special our relationship with him is. But wait, there's even more. It's incredible to think about who I'm praying to. Not only who and what he is, but that I've been given the privilege of calling upon him. However, there's one more thing that Jesus reminds us of when we approach God in prayer. There's a kingdom, and my Father is the King. Now, I don't know if Mark Twain wrote The Prince and the Pauper specifically as a Christian allegory, but there's enough symbolism in it to use it in church, so here I go. Imagine being born into poverty with abusive parents, mean, self-serving neighbors, and no discernible future beyond what you see around you. Then, suddenly finding yourself in a palace, dozens of people just waiting to see to your every desire. Now, without going into the moral lessons of the grass isn't always the greener, be careful what you wish for, or home is where the heart is, imagine just imagine the wonder of the castle moment. You, I, just like the pauper, have a castle moment waiting for us. Matthew 5.3 says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The poverty that I was born into was more than just the lack of money. I was born into a poverty that lacked life itself, and so were you. We were dead, with no hope of life. But, by God's grace, he gifted me with the faith to believe and introduced me to his son, Jesus. And like the impoverished boy in Mark Twain's story, I find myself in the palace of a king. Not as a servant or a stable boy, 
but as his adopted son with the run of the castle. My father is never too busy for me. He is never concentrating so hard on holding Saturn into orbit to shoo me away, because I am washed in the holy righteous blood of Jesus Christ. I can boldly stand before my Father with my request. Jesus told his disciples, when you pray, begin with putting God in the proper perspective. How could you possibly expect anyone less than my Father in heaven, that is the heavenly King, to be able to answer prayer? Who besides him is able? It's interesting that Pastor Michael just a week ago finished up teaching on Ephesians 3 because that chapter ends with a powerful example of what Jesus taught. Listen to Paul's prayer at the end of Ephesians 3 and pay attention to how Paul approaches God. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with the power through his Spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. How did the Apostle Paul see God as he entered into this prayer? He saw him as his father, holy and enthroned in heaven as king. And Paul approached him with the reverence for his majesty and power and with the love of a son. Having God in his proper place must, in your heart, kindle the desire to serve and obey. Look at what we just talked about. The love and immeasurable grace of the Father, the power and strength of the Creator of the universe, his holy and righteous nature, and the reigning King that is my Dad. How can I not desire to please him in all that I do? My Dad rules a kingdom. I am heir to that kingdom, chosen by grace and set apart by faith, and I have the right to walk right into the throne room and make requests of my Father. But there's another thing that having the right perspective does. It prepares your heart to receive. But to receive what? We'll discuss that in part two.